Um, so, uh, so everything I talk about is joint work with Manjul Bhargava and Jonathan Hankey. And I'm going to talk about class groups of n monogenic cubic fields. All right. So, so we're going to be talking about average results of torsion pieces of class groups. And there are an extensive set of conjectures, uh, which are known as the cohen lenstra martinet heuristics, which for very general, which, which are very general and sort of tell us exactly what we expect to happen in this topic. So basically given a degree N, what we do is we vary over uh, P torsion, we, we, give, we, we fix a degree N and we fix a prime P and, and we vary over degree N number fields. We assume P does not divide N and the cohen lenstra martinet heuristics predict the distribution of the P torsion subgroups of the class groups of degree and number fields. Uh, so they're very general heuristics and they tell us exactly what should happen for every degree N and for every prime P non-dividing N. But in this special case, only two cases of this conjecture have actually been proven. Um, and the first case actually predates the cohen lenstra heuristics. And once they made the heuristics, they, they were very happy to see that it agreed with a the theorem that was already known. And this is the case where n is two. So we're considering the family of quadratic fields k. We are ordering them by discriminant. And we are looking at the three torsion. So we're looking at n equal to two and p equal to three. And here's what the result says. The average size of the three torsion in the class groups of real quadratic fields is four by three. And the average size, if you instead go over complex quadratic fields, the average size is two. So this is a theorem due to Davenport and Hilbron, one of the landmark results of this field. The only other case uh, is a result of Bhargava, and this considers the family of cubic fields. So if you take the family of all cubic fields k and you order them by discriminant, uh, so this is so so here n is equal to three because we're taking cubic fields k and we're taking the prime two, and the result says that when you order cubic fields by discriminant, if you order over real cubic fields, the average size of the two torsion in their class groups is five by four. And if you instead consider complex cubic fields, the average size of the two torsion in their class groups is three by two. So these are the two results that are known. So I'll first of all point out that this isn't all of cohen lenstra even for uh, p equal to two and n equal to three, or p equal to three and n equal to two, because because the cohen lenstra heuristics tell you much more than just the average size. They they they, they tell you what the whole distribution should be, but we don't know that. Uh, Arul, in in Mundell's result, are the fields assumed Galois or not? No, in fact, sorry, I, I should. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so so these are these are the family of all cubic fields, and the non-Galois cubic fields are in fact going to predominate. Uh, there are around x cubic fields with discriminant less than x, of which only square root x are Galois. So this result of, of, of Manjul will sort of tells us what happens for the non-Galois case. The Galois case can be thrown in there and they, they don't interfere because there are so few of them. But if you want to know what is the average size of the two torsion of just Galois cubic fields, we don't know that. And in fact, that's a really interesting and, and possibly quite a difficult question. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Um, I'll just say one more thing about this uh, very interesting question is that if you, if, if you, if it's, it's very related, like computing the average size of the two torsion in the class groups of Galois cubic fields is very related to counting A4, um, to counting, to counting uh, A4 quartic fields. So quartic fields whose Galois closure have Galois group A4, and we just don't know how to do that. If instead we are in the non-Galois case, then, the, then this question is related to counting um, uh, quartic fields whose Galois closure is S4. And that we can do. And that's the difference. The reason we can do the non-Galois case but not the Galois case is because we can count S4 fields and not A4 fields. OK, great. Um, I also want to say a few more things. So the Cohen and Enstra don't actually talk about the case when p does divide n but if but that is a very interesting case and there are lots of conjectures uh, on that as well uh, specifically by girth 
and recent work of Alex Smith for the case when the prime P is two and the degree N is two uh, is, is quite spectacular. It sort of, it sort of determines the entire distribution. Uh, there's also been a lot of results in the function field case, starting with work of Ellenberg, Venkatesh and Westerlin, and also work of Melanie Wood and many others. Okay, so let me, um, let me continue. So these are the two results that are known. Uh, and we're gonna be focusing on the case when, uh, on, 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 on families of cubic fields. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about cohen lenstra um, Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I can make this full screen, but I don't think I know how to. Oh, there we go, excellent. Okay, so, okay, so there are some assumptions that are implicitly made whenever we mention the cohen lenstra or cohen martinet heuristics. The first one is that we are considering the full family of degree N fields. Cohen and Lenstra don't say what happens if you, they, they, they just assume you're, you're, you're going over all degree N fields. And it's also assumed because I mean, there are infinitely many fields. So how do you even say average number? What's the average size of the two torsion? You have to order the fields in some way. Uh, the, quest, the, the question of taking an average doesn't make sense over an infinite family unless you're ordering it in some way. And Cohen and Lenstra assume that, Cohen and Lenstra and Martini assume that the fields are always being ordered by discriminant. But that's obviously not needed. I mean, you could restrict to a subfamily of fields, you could order by something other than discriminant and you could see what happens. You could ask what happens. Um, so that's one of the questions we're gonna be focusing on. Like, should these heuristics change? And how should these heuristics change if we restrict to natural subfamilies? And, does, and should something change if instead of looking at a subfamily, we impose a different ordering? Okay. So the most natural subfamily is the one that you have when you impose local conditions. So instead of taking all quadratic fields, you say, well, I'll only take the quadratic fields with two splits, or I'll only take the quadratic fields with two splits and three stays inert, something like that. You fix some number of primes, and then you impose splitting conditions at those primes. And that will give you a subfamily. And those are the most natural subfamilies. So we already know that local conditions at infinity can change the averages. Because if you'll recall, the average sizes for real quadratic fields were different than the average sizes for complex quadratic fields. And the average families for real cubic fields were different from the average values for complex cubic fields. So local conditions at infinity do change the averages, but they change it for a very specific reason. The local splitting type at infinity basically tells you what the size of the unit group is, right? It tells you what the rank of the unit group is. And if your unit group is bigger, so for example, if you have real quadratic fields, your, 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 your regulator is going to be bigger. And if your regulator is bigger, your class group is going to be smaller. And that is a very good reason for why local conditions infinity do change the averages. However, this is a beautiful theorem due to Bhargava and Varma. And the result says that if once you've fixed your local condition at infinity, if you instead impose any finite set of local conditions at any finite number of finite primes, then the values do not change. So instead of looking at the family of imaginary quadratic fields, if you look at the family of imaginary quadratic fields, which satisfies splitting conditions at any finite number of primes, then you can compute the average size of the three torsion in their class groups and the average size does not change. So that's a very nice result because what it basically says is that the cohen Lenstra and cohen Martin heuristics are actually quite stable. They remain stable under, impo under imposing any splitting conditions at any finite set of primes. Okay. So now that we understand what happens when we impose local conditions, we're gonna start trying to impose certain global conditions. And so for the rest of this talk, we're gonna be taking the family of cubic fields. We're gonna be imposing global conditions on those cubic fields. That will give us a different family, like a subfamily. And we're gonna be seeing what happens to the average size of the two torsion in their class groups. So in order to 
uh, so the so the global condition we're going to be imposing is monogeneity or in more in more general terms uh, n monogeneity so let me just define what these global conditions are so if we have a number field k with ring of integers ok k is said to be monogenic if ok is generated by just one element so ok needs to be z alpha for some alpha and ok and if that happens then k is said to be monogenic and we are not just going to impose the condition of monogenicity we're going to carry the alpha around instead of just saying k is monogenic we're going to carry alpha around and we'll call k comma alpha to be a monogenized field this is actually not particularly important but it just makes everything much cleaner and I'll, I'll i'll explain why this is not so important in later on in this slide okay and more generally if you have some integer n um a pair k comma alpha is said to be n monogenized if the following is condition if the following is true first of all instead of saying that ok is equal to z alpha we want z alpha to be index n within ok so z alpha is not all of ok but it's close it has index n in ok secondly we want alpha to be primitive in ok mod z all right so that's what an n monogenized cubic field is we take a cubic field along with an integer alpha in ok such that z alpha generate something that is index n inside ok and alpha needs to be primitive um so by primitive you mean that it's not the multiple of any element exactly 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 so now we also need a notion of what it means to be isomorphic so two n monogenized is a very natural condition the, so the point is that if in, so first of all of course if k alpha and k prime k prime alpha prime are said to be isomorphic then first of all k and k prime should be isomorphic but here's the thing if you look at z alpha and you look at z alpha in, in instead of alpha you look at alpha plus 1 z alpha is going to be equal to z alpha plus 1 so they'll generate the same ring which means they'll have the same index inside okay so if k comma alpha is n monogenized so is k comma alpha plus 1 and that's not really something different so we don't just say that you need an isomorphism which takes alpha to alpha prime it's enough to take alpha to alpha prime plus m for any m in z basically we're saying that k comma alpha we're considering it to be to be isomorphic to k comma alpha plus 1 okay so now we have our family of n monogenized cubic fields and we have a notion of isomorphism on it and here are some very nice facts about n monogenizers in cubic fields first of all every cubic field has a reasonably small n monogenizer in 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 particular you can take n to be less than discriminant of the cubic field to the power of 1 by 4 I mean like it's easy to make an n monogenizer if you don't care what n is right you just take your cubic field you take okay you take any primitive element alpha and okay and there you have an n monogenized cubic field and you can if you just pick the smallest alpha that that's available you'll see that it's an n monogenizer for n which is less than less than the discriminant to the power of 1 by 4 so every cubic field does have n monogenizers for a fixed n and this is a this is really nice this is a really nice result it's quite deep uh it's it's actually due to work of uh thew zegel uh delon and everts and the result says that if you fix an n a cubic field has an absolutely bounded number of n monogenizers independent of the cubic field so for example if n is equal to 1 this says that a cubic field has at most one uh, has at most 12 monogenizers so that's pretty nice as well and that's why it doesn't really make a difference that we're carrying around the pair k comma alpha rather than just k because because a k can occur at most 12 times and most of the time it occurs just once okay so these are two nice facts about n monogenizers but here's the thing so we 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 now know what a monogenized cubic field is what an n monogenized cubic field is and what isomorphism classes of these things are however to make a family we have to order them in some way 
So I'm not going to tell you how to order them. Ideally, we would order them by discriminant. The problem is we actually don't know how to do that in the sense that if I, that we don't even know the, we, we can't even answer the question how many monogenized cubic fields are there with discriminant less than X. We don't, that's a hard Diophantine question that we don't know how to answer. So instead, we're going to be ordering n monogenized cubic fields by a very natural height that's going to be designed to mimic the discriminant. So let me define the height for you. So if K comma alpha is an n-monogenized cubic field, then first of all, note that it's completely determined by alpha. Alpha determines K. All you have to do is take Q adjoint alpha and that's K. So um, here's what we'll do. Uh, we'll take the characteristic polynomial of alpha. Let's call it F of X. And remember, you're allowed to replace alpha with alpha plus M. That doesn't change the isomorphism class of the n monogenized cubic field. And so we may assume that the trace of alpha is either minus one, zero, or one. So now, I'll, now the height of k comma alpha is, is this. So it's, it's an n monogenized cubic field. You have your characteristic polynomial. You just take the height of your characteristic polynomial. So you, you, your characteristic polynomial is x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c. a is irrelevant. It's either minus one, zero, or one. And your height is just, you take max of 4b cubed and 27c squared, and then you multiply by n to the minus 2. The reason you multiply by n to the minus 2 is, is then the height actually mimics what the discriminant of k looks like, rather than just the discriminant of z alpha. So the height mimics it. Uh, the discriminant is very close to the height. However, the discriminant could be much smaller than the height in certain special cases, but that's supposed to happen rarely. So I'm not going to talk much about how the discriminant could differ from the height, but uh, it, it's supposed to happen very rarely. This height should behave very much like the discriminant. Okay. So now we will construct our families of n monogenized cubic fields. So the first family is we pick a delta. This delta is going to be greater than zero and less than or equal to one by four. And then we make the family F delta. F delta denotes the family of all N monogenized cubic fields K comma alpha, where N is less than or equal to the height to the power of delta. So N has got to be somewhat small and um, uh, compared, to, compared to the height. So here are the asymptotics of F delta, the number of the number of, uh, I'm sorry, there's, there's a typo here that I corrected in the earlier thing, but for some reason in this PDF, it showed up. There's no C. The C here, the C we're taking is always one. So, so FC delta is just F delta. The number of fields in F delta with height less than X is around X to the five by six plus two delta by three. That's how it grows. Uh, so the family F one by four, if you take delta to be one by four, you can check that the family that that the number of uh, cubic fields in F one by four with height less than x is looks very much like x. It's it's it grows asymptotic to x because five by six plus two delta by three will then become one. And this family is very similar to the family of all cubic fields ordered by height. Because remember, we already saw that every cubic field does have a monogenizer of size less than less than the discriminant to the power of one by four, and it will have a monogenizer of size height to the power of one by four as well. So the family uh, F one by four is, is basically the family of all cubic fields ordered by height. However, if Delta is less than one by four, then this family is supposed to be thin. There are, that there are way less than X fields in it. Okay. So now that we have our families, uh, let me state the results. So the first result is if you have delta greater than zero and you order cubic fields in F delta by height, then the average size of the two torsion over real cubic fields is five by four as before. It's the same as in Munjil's result. And the average size over complex fields is three by two. Again, the same as in the previous result. So this again, this result, like all other results so far, is, uh, is joint work with Manjul Bhargava and Jonathan Hanke. Um, and what we prove is that if you look at these families, F delta of N monogenized cubic fields, where N is varying, 
then the average sizes of the two torsion in the class groups of these cubic fields do not change. Moreover, if you take these families and in addition impose finitely many local conditions, the results still don't change. So the result of Bhargava and Varma, which says that in the family of all cubic fields, if you impose conditions at finite primes, uh, the average values don't change, carries over here exactly. So, so I mean, are all these results don't depend on delta then? No? These results don't depend on delta, absolutely. Like you can take delta greater than zero and you can move all the way from zero to one by four and the results don't change. Actually, the better way to think about it is look at the look at delta equals one by four. That's basically the family of all cubic fields, except you're ordering them by height. Mm -hmm. So the result doesn't change. So what it says there is that instead of ordering by discriminant cubic fields, if you order them by height, mm -hmm. th the values don't change. And then you can start decreasing delta, getting a smaller and smaller family. Mm -hmm. And delta can go all the way down, as long as it's positive, all the way down to zero, and the results don't change. Mm -hmm. And at any stage, you can also then impose finitely many local conditions and the results still don't change. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of extraordinarily stable. However, what we're going to do next is consider the limiting situation where delta is zero. So when delta is zero, what is that limiting situation? We want to have an n monogenizer where n is less than the height to the power of zero. So n has to be one. That's just the family of monogenized cubic fields. So what's happening here? We are looking at monogenized cubic fields. We are ordering them by height. And now if you average the two torsion in the class groups, they do change. Over real cubic fields, it becomes three by two. Over complex cubic fields, it becomes two. So here the results have changed. And they've changed in a very nice way. What has happened is that when we average, for example, the two torsion of the class group over real fields, let's look at the top result for, for now. The average size we say is five by four. However, the two like this, this group CL2 of K, it has an element in it. It always has one element, namely the identity. So when we say, so when we write five by four, we should really think of five by four as being one plus one by four. The one is always there and the average size of the number of non-trivial elements is one by four. And the one by four has doubled to one by two from the first result to the second result. And the one by two in part B, because if you write three by two is one plus one by two, this one by two has doubled to one as you go from part B of the first result to part B of the second result. Um, again, imposing finitely many local conditions leave the result unchanged. But what this seems to be saying, what this result seems to be saying is that monogenicity has a doubling effect on the non-trivial part of the two torsion in the class group. For some reason, imposing monogenicity doubles on average the non-trivial part. Okay. So... So that's the first result. Uh, so that those are the first two results, both joint with Manjul Bhargava and John Henke. And let's continue. So now we know what happens to monogenized cubic fields. What happens to n monogenized cubic fields as n varies? Uh, I mean, hmm. where n is not one, but still fixed. Remember the first result in the family itself, n is allowed to vary. N is allowed to go all the way from one to something fairly large. In the second result, n is forced to be one. In the remainder of the results, we're going to take n fixed, but different from one. Um, so I now what we... Oh, sorry. Last slide. I beg your pardon? So you can ask a question about the last slide. Oh, absolutely. Um, so one way to maybe interpret this is that you're saying that the non-monogenic fields have lower class number than, the, um, than usual. Is that right? Abs absolutely. That, yeah, absolutely. And Absolutely. Is there, That's somehow. Um, is there some way to see this heuristically um, as to why this should happen? No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we don't have a very good reason for why this happens. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, it, it is not. No, sorry. 
yeah we've thought about this quite a bit but at least for now we don't have great reasons for why this is happening i'll i'll explain some sort of reason later on in the talk but yeah this is not it's not it's not it's not really clear okay yeah thank you great okay so let's continue let's look at the family of n monogenized cubic fields where n is fixed so n is fixed and fn denotes the family of n monogenized cubic fields ordered by height throughout this talk we are ordering everything by height and now our result uh, joined with manjula and john is the following so let's write n as m squared k where k is square free if you order fn by height the average size of the class group over the in the real case is 5 by 4 plus 1 by 4 sigma k and in the complex case it's 3 by 2 plus 1 by 2 sigma k sigma k here is just the sum of the divisors of k so that's the result so it's different as k varies as 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 you go through different ends you get different k's and therefore you get different averages and they're all between 5 by 4 and 3 by 2 the smallest sigma k can get is 1 in which case you get uh 5 by 4 will become 3 by 2 and 3 by 2 will become uh 2 but yeah you just get stuff that goes between these two results like like we have a 5 by 4 and 3 by 2 and we have a 3 by 2 and 2 and instead of looking at monogenized cubic fields if you look at n monogenized cubic fields you get a range of values between the min of 5 by 4 and the max of 3 by 2 in the real case and the min of 3 by 2 and the max of 2 in the complex case so somehow the square indices that are that are spike, uh, spiking no absolutely absolutely for some reason yeah exactly it's spiking it exactly exactly so one thing is notably missing in this result we haven't said what happens when we impose local conditions and all the previous results starting from davenport helbron to munjur's result to the family's f delta to the family of monogenized fields when you impose local conditions at primes the value remains unchanged here on the other hand averages do change when you impose local conditions they however they only change when you impose local conditions at primes dividing n if you impose local conditions at primes not dividing n it won't change but if you impose local conditions of primes dividing n they do change so let me give you an example of of this phenomena if instead of looking at the full family fn you only look at those fields in fn that are unramified at all primes dividing n so this is a sub family if you impose congruence conditions at every prime dividing n and if you order these by height then the average size of in the real case is 3 by 2 when n is a square and 5 by 4 when n is not a square in the complex case the average size is 2 when n is a square and 3 by 2 when n is not a square so in particular the two results in this page they have different values the first result is a family of everything in fn the second result is just the family of the sub family within fn but you impose unramified at every prime dividing n and the averages have changed so it turns out that averages can that local conditions can change the average uh so let me now state the final result which sort of explains how local conditions can change the average so for that we need a definition so an n monogenized cubic field is said to be sufficiently ramified at a prime p uh, here p divides n at a prime p dividing n if one of the following conditions holds so if we, uh, first kp which is k tensor qp is totally ramified if you're totally ramified by which i mean it is it is you know k tensor qp is a cubic ramified extension of qp it's a field uh, and it's 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 a field extension of qp and it's ramified so if you're totally ramified then you are in fact sufficiently ramified however to be ramified you don't have to be totally ramified kp 
could just be QP cross F, where F is a ramified field. In that case, you're not always sufficiently ramified. You're sufficiently ramified if the following happens. Uh, ZP adjoined alpha P should split as, K, as ZP cross O, where O is an order inside FP. ZP adjoined alpha P doesn't always have to split. Alpha P here is just the is just alpha considered as an element of KP. Um, right? Because it's not just K. When I'm not saying we're not saying when K is sufficient ramified, when the pair K comma alpha is sufficient ramified. So you look at alpha, it's considered as an element of KP. We'll call that alpha P. ZP adjoined alpha P doesn't always have to split. But if it does split, then we say that it is sufficiently ramified. Okay, so that's what it means to be sufficiently ramified. Now, suppose F inside Fn is any sub is a subfamily defined by local conditions at finitely many primes p. You can define the density rho p of F to be the density of fields in Fn that are sufficiently ramified at p. And then you can take rho of f to be the product over all p dividing k rho p of f. So that's the, de that's the density of fields in Fn that are sufficiently ramified at every prime dividing k. And then our result, joined again, of course, with Manjul and John, is that when these fields k comma alpha are ordered by height, the average size over real k comma alpha is 5 by 4 plus 1 by 4 rho f. And over the complex case, it's 3 by 2 plus 1 by 2 rho f. So what this is saying is something very specific. This is saying that the increase for non-square n. So first of all, if, if n is a square, you just increase. There's no question about it. You just always increase. If n is 1, you get an increased number. If n is any square, you just increase. Your class, your average sizes just increase. But if n is not a square, then you then the increase is completely contained within the sufficiently ramified fields. So that's that's the upshot of all these numerics. Um, okay, but I mean. The, the good thing is we sort of have very precise results. We know exactly what these numbers are supposed to be. So now let me talk about some data because you might be getting suspicious, right? Like the numbers were so nice, five by four and three by two. And then after that, they became three by two and two, which are also pretty nice. But now we have these sort of crazy numbers, five by four plus one by four row of F and so on and so forth. So here's some data. So this data is computed using magma and it's not great. This should be considered as very preliminary data because we didn't take too many different fields. Uh, this is all over, this is all over totally real cubic fields also. And for each N, the average is computed uh, by taking around 1800 fields and the heights are really gigantic. The heights have size around 10 to the 20, anything less than that. And we didn't get anywhere near as good results. I was actually amazed that magma could compute class groups for fields with such height, uh, but apparently it can. Okay, so here's what happens when n is equal to one. Uh, I shouldn't say predicted average, I should say proved average. We prove the average of 1.5 and we compute the average of 1.5003. So that's, that's pretty close. And here are the rest. They're not quite as spectacularly close, but they're still, it's still pretty good. It's pretty close. You can see that, sorry, you shouldn't read predicted average, read proved average, but um, but yeah, you can see that, that there's not too much deviation uh, between what's computed and what's proved. And that there is a lot of deviation as n varies, even in the computations. Um, do you get any bounds at all on the error too? That's a very good question. Yes, we get a power save. I mean, we don't, we don't, it, it is possible to get a power saving error term. It is possible to get a power saving error term, 
but the power saving won't be too good. Uh, let me try and explain why. Let's let's take the n equal to one case for example. We're taking the family of monogenized cubic fields. Yeah, so we expect there to be about x to the five by six of them if you order by discriminant. We're ordering by height, so we prove there are about x to the five by six monogenized cubic fields with height less than x. So some constant times x to the five by six. Now, as we compute the we we now instead of summing just these monogenized cubic fields, we are summing the cubic field, but weighted by the size of the two torsion in the class group, and we prove that it's some other constant, which you know the, the other constant is three by two times the first constant, uh, times x to the five by six. Now the problem is that this is going to have a second main term, and the second main term is going to be an x to the three by four. So five by so x to the five by six is the first term. X to the three by four is the second term. And there's not that much difference between x to the five by six and x to the three by four. So so whatever power saving error term that we get is not going to be great. It's not going to be something like your main term is x to the five by six and your error term is x to the half. Error term is going to be at least bigger than x to the three by four because you have a secondary main term. And that makes everything. That makes numerics quite complicated because the difference between x to the five by six and x to the three by four doesn't manifest itself until x is really huge. Um, but yes, but we can get a power saving error. Term. Okay. So after this, I'm going to talk about the proof for the remainder of the time. So if you have any questions, now is a, a great time. Um, is there is, is there anything to do with the fact that the orders themselves have a class group? The difference you're seeing um, does that contribute at all in some way? That's uh, these are all excellent questions. Um, so I must say the sh short answer is for I don't know for now, mm -hmm. but there has been very beautiful work on class groups of orders of cubic fields. By uh, Manjul Bhargavan Ila Varma, uh, and you can see that orders do manifest some of these properties. As you go over class groups of orders, you do see some changes. Like it's, it's, you can impose congruence conditions which will change the size, the average size of the class groups. I mean, the the class group of an order is bigger. It could be bigger than the class group of mm -hmm. of the maximal order. Um, but our results are all about maximal orders right. so so it's not totally it's not totally clear but i mean a very natural question to ask for example is is well let's instead of going over monogenized cubic fields let's go over monogenized cubic orders and see what happens and, and we are studying it so joint with um artin siad ashwin swaminathan and ila varma we are studying this question but but for now i do not I do not know what happens when you instead just go over orders. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I'll move on to talking about the proofs. And the proof, as in so many results in arithmetic statistics, is in multiple steps. The first one of which is the parameterization. We want to parameterize all the relevant arithmetic objects. So let's start off by parameterizing n monogenized cubic fields. So take the set of cubic polynomials U, let U n inside U be the subspace of cubic polynomials whose leading coefficient is n. There's an action of G A on U. It's pretty easy. The way lambda acts on f of x is you just send it to f of x plus lambda. And this action preserves the leading coefficient, and so it preserves u n for every n. So what's the first parameterization result is that the set of n monogenized cubic fields naturally injects into the set of z orbits on u n z. And the way it, the way it happens is if you have an n monogenized cubic field k comma alpha, 
you just take alpha you take its characteristic polynomial and then you modify it a little bit and that's how you send k comma alpha uh, to an element of u and z so the parameterization of n monogenized cubic fields is very simple it's just sits inside a very easy to define subset um very natural to define i should say it's a little bit annoying to actually say say exactly what that set is but it's very natural it naturally injects into the set of z orbits in u and z but that's not enough we want to parameterize not just n monogenized cubic fields but we want to parameterize pairs n monogenized cubic fields we want to parameterize a pair k comma alpha sorry k comma sigma where k is an n monogenized cubic field and sigma is an element in the two torsion group uh, of the class group of k so to do that we need this bigger space so let v be the space of pairs of ternary quadratic forms and there's a natural resolvent map from v to u so you think of an element in v as a pair a comma b where a and b are symmetric 3 by 3 matrices so once you think of it that way you have this map where you take a comma b you look at determinant of ax plus b you multiply by 4 and that gives you a, the what's called the resolvent map from v to u so now the group ga cross sl3 acts on v and the way it acts is so ga acts is before lambda acting on a comma b will just stay will just send it to a comma b plus lambda a and the way sl3 acts is just by changing bases on both a and b simultaneously so you have this group action on v which respects the resolvent and it's a it's a landmark result of bharkava that if you have a polynomial f of x which corresponds to ok so it corresponds to the ring of integers of some cubic field k then there is a bijection between the sl3 z orbits on resolvent inverse f and index 2 subgroups of the class group of k so we can parameterize index 2 subgroups of the class group of k and the number of index 2 subgroups of the class group of k is just equal to the number of two torsion elements in the class group of k so instead of counting two torsion elements in the class group of k we can instead just count index 2 subgroups in the class group of k okay so now we have a beautiful parameterization the parameterization is inter- it parameterizes the arithmetic objects we want in terms of group orbits on uh group orbits on certain lattices but now you have to count these lattice points so for the first type of result when our families were f delta in which n was allowed to vary what we need to do what we needed to do was count z orbits on uz and z cross sl3z orbits on vz having bounded height and index for the other results where n was fixed so where the family was fn what we have to do is count z orbits on unz and z cross sl3z orbits on resolvent inverse unz again having bounded height now here's the problem so the first result counting is not is is fine but for the second result there's a genuine problem resolvent inverse of u and z is the set of all pairs a comma b in vz where determinant of a is n by 4 but this condition determinant a equals n by 4 is not a linear condition determinant a equals n by 4 is a degree 3 condition so instead of co- having to count points in a lattice we have to count points uh, we have to count points on some hypersurface and this high and it's very hard in general to count points on hypersurfaces like it's no fun trying to count points on some variety integer points on some variety that's covered by some polynomial equation even as nice as determinant a equals something so what we do to get around this is the following um we w- it, we don't just want to count all points a comma b where determinant a is n by 4 we want to count sl3z orbits on these 
So we will use the action of SL3Z to bring A to one of finitely many matrices. And then with A fixed, we will count SOAZ orbits on integral ternary quadratic forms B. So we'll use the SL3Z action to fix A. And then once A is fixed, we will count SOAZ actions on B. So once we've done that, we have to sum over all the A's. And which A's are they? We will sum over a set of representatives for the action of SL3Z on integral ternary quadratic forms A, whose determinant is n by 4. So that's the strategy. What we did is we linearized the problem. Determinant A equals n by 4 is not a linear condition. However, we by using this group SL3Z and then counting SOA, SOAZ orbits, we have reduced our problem to one where we just have to count points in vector spaces and not varieties. But there's a cost to doing it. The cost to doing it is now you have to sum over the num you have to sum over representatives A uh, for the action of SL3Z on all integral term quadratic forms with determinant n by four. And n is varying here, so it's some it can get quite complicated. Okay. So in both cases, you have to, you do this by performing, by using geometry of numbers methods, and then you have to perform a sieve because remember, we're not counting all points in UN of Z. You're only counting certain points. Those points are cut out by congruence conditions. And in order to make everything work, you have to do a lot of sieving. You have to prove a lot of tail estimates. Um, however, I won't talk about any of that. And I'll just move on to to the next part of the proof. So let's assume that after this setup, we've performed the count using geometry of numbers, we've performed the sieve. Once you've performed the sieve, you have your answers, but the answers are not explicit. The answers are all going to be in terms of products of local volumes. And they're going to be products of local volumes within UQP, UNQP, VQP, and VAQP. It's going to be it's going to be something that's very unexplicit and you're going to have a sum over A which shows up. So the way you compute these local volumes is using what's called a mass formula. So I'm just going to so like skip this for a minute. I'll just tell you what it looks like. So the average, the, the average size of the class group over K in some family F is going to look like this. So first of all, we are assuming that our family F is, is something like F delta, so N is varying. So the way the answers will look, the way the average will look is first of all, there's a one, and the one is just coming from the identity element in the class groups that are always there. And you add to it the Tamagawa number of SL3Q because you're counting SL3Z orbits, the Tamagawa number shows up. And then you have a mass at infinity, and then you have a quotient of local masses. You have a mass at each prime p, and you have to compute the average size of this mass. So the mass is defined quite nicely as follows. Uh, for a form f corresponding to kp over qp, the mass is just, you, you take f, you lift it up, you look at all a comma b, which have resolvent f, and you add up one by the stabilizer of a comma b. And this has a very nice meaning. All you're doing is, uh, if, if your form F corresponds to KP, you're looking at all quartic etal algebras over QP whose resolvent is KP and you're adding up these quartic etal algebras, but of course they're weighted by one by, their, by the size uh, of their automorphism groups. So these masses arise very naturally and these answers always show up in terms of local masses. So it turns out in this case, when N is varying, the local mass is always one. So you're left with one plus the Tamagawa number of SL3Q times the infinite mass. Now the Tamagawa number of SL3Q is just one and the infinite mass, so, so your answer is just your infinite mass. And your infinite mass, it turns out in the, in the real case is one by four and in the complex case is one by two. So you just get one plus one by four as the average in the real case and one plus one by two as the average in the imaginary case. And the answer is just the infinite mass. 
this in fact is another way to try and understand the Cohen Leinster heuristics, not in terms of uh, random groups, but in terms of local masses. But okay, so we have, so this is how it works for varying n. You just have to prove this mass formula. You have to prove that this local mass is always one at finitely many primes, and then you have to compute it at the infinite place, and you're done. So what happens if instead of Ah, so yeah, so so yeah. All, all you need to do is compute the infinite mass. So what happens if instead of looking at varying n, you look at fixed n? So now things change quite a bit. The theory. So now, very crucially, we have to use the theory of quadratic forms. So first, the first change is that instead of the group SL three, we have the group SO three because if you remember, we were not adding SL three z orbits; we were adding SOA z orbits. And then adding over a, but the controlling group instead of SL three has now become SO three, and so the Tamagawa number jumps from one to two instead of SL three as Tamagawa number one, but SO three as Tamagawa number two. And this jump, by the way, from one to two is exactly why in the monogenized fields we have a doubling of the non-trivial part. Instead of five by four, we had three by two, so one by four became one by two, and one by two became one. However, the masses also could change. They don't change when n is equal to one, but they change for all n greater than one. Instead of getting, so so in so so the so now instead of instead of what we call instead of what previously we could have called the total mass, now we get partial masses. Instead of summing over everything in res resolvent inverse of f, we only sum over those pairs a comma b where a is something fixed. So this is this is a partial mass. Instead of going over all a, a now is fixed. So you only get part of a mass. And it turns out that this partial mass is always one of three values. It's either zero, or it's one by two, or it's one. And unless you're sufficiently ramified, the partial mass is always one by two. And what you're left with to evaluate is something which looks like this. We have to we have a two out front coming from the Tamagawa number, and we are summing over a. Uh, we're summing over all genera. Uh, we're summing over genera a having determinant. Actually, it shouldn't be n. It should be n by four. Uh, the infinite mass is still there, but now instead of the total mass, we have to integrate only the partial mass. And evaluating the sum. Which requires using the theory of quadratic forms along with the computation of these masses, it yields the results that we need. So, very quickly in the two minutes that are left, let me tell you about some really nice generalizations to the higher degree case. So, instead of degree three, which this talk has been about, you could look at degree D. You could look at any degree D, and you could look at the family of monogenized degree D number fields. So this is not n this is just one monogenized degree D number fields. Uh, it's a very natural family of degree D fields. And you can take those degree D fields that have a fixed signature. And the recent theorem of Arte and Siad is that is the computation of the, the size of the two torsion of the class group. And it's one plus. Two to the power of two minus r one minus r two, where the signature is r one comma r two. It's it's only an upper bound that's proved for now, but the equality is conditional on a widely expected tail estimate. And in the even case, it's it's more complicated, but Artain has also solved this question in the even case. The average size of the two torsion of the class group. Um. The even case that Sia solves is actually really interesting because you have all sorts of complications to then it's 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 sufficiently complicated that we don't even have heuristics of what happens because you not only have Cohen Leinster randomness but also genus theory which could interact in some way. Um, and Artain separates the contribution coming from genus theory as well, uh, from the contribution that comes from the Cohen Leinster randomness, and completely solves the monogenized case for all degrees greater than or equal to three. Um, and this uses, so here one of the key ingredients is that instead of 
Bhargava's parameterization for n equal to 3, you have to use Wood's parameterization, which generalizes it to higher degrees. And if you're wondering what happens to n monogenized cubic fields, not quite n monogenized, you have to, you have to, it's, it's a slightly different family when d is not 3, but for like the analogous family, uh, as both d and n varies, that is also known. This is the result of Ashwin Swaminathan uh, very recently, who for all d greater than or equal to 3, computes the average size of the two torsion of the class group in these families. Uh, once again, it's the upper bound is unconditional, but the lower bound is conditional on a widely expected tail estimate. There's also an analogous and much more complicated result in the even degree case, also known by Swaminathan. Okay, so Siyad and Swaminathan's work have some amazing applications. They can find fields with odd class numbers. They can prove results about unit signatures and much more. The results are, in fact, now up in the archives, so, so you can check those out as well. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'll pause now. I'll stop now for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Arul. Thanks. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I don't. I see a lot of applauses, but I don't see any hands up. So the the last results you're you're mentioning. Um, so the the upper bounds are known, and you're saying there's some um, error term or something that you expect to to not to not. Um, Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Like one of the one of the steps I skipped over in this proof is that of a square free sieve. Mm -hmm. So the problem is if you count. Like for in our case, even right. Like if in our case we had to count, uh, let me just see if I could get back very quickly. But if you remember, I said n monogenized cubic fields you can put inside. Uh, there we go. Uh, n monogenized cubic fields sit inside z orbits of u and z, mm -hmm. z orbits in u and z. But actually, z orbits of u and z parameterize n monogenized rings. We don't want all rings. We want only fields. Mm -hmm. So we want only those polynomials which cut out a maximal order. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you cut out? A, so, so you have to throw out for every prime P uh, orders that are non-maximal at P. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you need a tail estimate. Mm -hmm. And proving these tail estimates are often very difficult. Oh. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's currently, that's currently not known for the spaces which Artane and Ashwin have to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we did manage to do it for our case. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult in the monogenized case than in the case of all cubic fields. The reason is that somehow when the, when the vector space involved is pre-homogeneous, these tail estimates seem to work quite nicely. But in our case, the vector spaces are not pre-homogeneous, they're co-regular. And then the tail estimates become, become more difficult. Uh, but we used a lot of low dimensional coincidences in our proofs and those proofs don't carry over at all for the higher degree case. Mm -hmm. But I mean, hopefully in time, those tail estimates will also be proven. Mm -hmm. And could I ask also a basic question from the beginning of your talk? Absolutely. Um, so as you pointed out, if you, once you impose the Archimedean conditions, any additional local conditions don't seem to change the result. But, Absolutely. But, but I mean, if you think of the Archimedean conditions also as a kind of local condition, then um, suppose I had imposed a certain number of non-Archimedean um, finite conditions. Um, Absolutely. Would, is there a theorem of that kind? It's a beautiful question. This is a really, really great question. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is that in the original results that we started off with, the result of Davenport Helbron and the result of Bhargava, mm -hmm. for the kind of families that show up, you don't have very natural you, the only the only non archimedean the only archimedean conditions you have are the signature mm -hmm. though you could impose uh, sorry you could impose other other conditions for example you could say what happens if you restrict to cubic fields so for quadratic fields there's not much you can do but for cubic fields you can say quite a lot you can say look i i want only those cubic fields whose shapes lie in a certain region Mm -hmm. Right? 
that's a very natural thing to say i you can you can put more archimedean conditions by restricting the shape of the cubic field mm-hmm. so i don't think this is actually been written up so, but 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 it but it's certainly true it, it could potentially follow from the work of piper haren and manjul bhargava uh, mm-hmm. so manjul bhargava and piper haren talk about uh, they count cubic fields having certain shape having restricted shape they also count quartic fields having restricted shape their result and i think so current work of of piper haren like current ongoing work of piper haren will will say what happens when you restrict the shape mm-hmm. so you can put a lot of additional archimedean conditions by saying that look at the shape of look at the shape of all possible fields and i will just take a certain region within the region of all shapes and insist that these are the that all the cubic fields you look at have this shape and within that family compute the average size of the true torsion and 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 it shouldn't change once you fixed either real or complex the numbers shouldn't change mm-hmm. and and like the sort of ground works for that are already laid out in this joint work this beautiful joint work of manjul bhagavan piper haren and ongoing work of piper haren mm-hmm. uh will 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 prove this absolutely absolutely interesting um when you look at the family of n monogenized cubic fields or monogenized cubic fields you have way more archimedean conditions and non archimedean conditions that you can impose because it's not just the shape of the cubic field but it's where does alpha sit inside that shape mm-hmm. even non archimedeally you can you have a lot more room for imposing shapes and and as sort of quote unquote most general result handles all of that like no matter what conditions you put it will compute the average mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh sorry that's the disadvantage i suppose of having this mm-hmm. kind of setup mm-hmm. is it's hard to navigate okay uh but but yes uh, so i think this is this is the yeah so this result the kind of families f that are allowed for this result are very general you can impose lots of shapes at both the archimedean as well as the non archimedean places mm-hmm. 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 absolutely Very and it's true. somehow this strange condition of sufficient ramification that controls everything mhm sufficient ramification this is this um the splitting absolutely so that absolutely. i mean that that presumably can be interpreted in terms of a uh, condition on the prime p splitting and the you're having a spe- specific kind of splitting exactly degree exactly one times the degree 2 and the degree 2 is ramified it looks like and the degree to zero effect but also more like it's 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 somehow saying both how the prime p should behave at k but also how it should behave at z alpha mm-hmm. 